All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Don't worry, this presentation, the theme of the, our demos is coffee, so I, I understand that. It's afternoon, third day of build. Really excited to be here. Thank you all for being here. Tons of announcements, exciting things. Um, and what we want to do here today is talk a little bit. You all have been hearing about serverless and Azure Functions. It's my third build. Every build, we see more and more momentum and more and more usage on serverless application, event-driven applications in Azure Functions. But we still also see a lot, of, a lot of companies, a lot of you, a lot of developers, they're starting their journey. And they don't know where to start. They have applications that are already built. And they want to use serverless. They don't know exactly sure how. So what we want to talk about is, imagine you already have your applications and you want to extend it further. You want to add functions. You want to add serverless to extend your scenarios. That's probably the best way to start and what we recommend. We don't go recommending go rewrite all your code, make everything functions as much as I love functions. We want you to achieve more innovation on your code. So, so here's the plan of what, what um, we're going to show you today. So we're going to talk about what scenario that we're going to build throughout the talk. So we're going to keep extending it. So Darius going to introduce you to, to it. Um, after that, just to level set, we're going to do a brief overview on some of the concepts that are going to be important for you to understand what happens later on. And then we're going to extend that app in these four different ways you see there. Um, and then at the end, we're going to leave you with some stuff you can take away so you can implement some of these scenarios yourselves. And before we go too far, so you know, you know why you should listen to us, but um, I'm, I'm on the PM team. Uh, I lead the PM team for Azure Functions. Um, that as well, we're both on the same team. Um, particularly what I look at these days is how do we bring functions to more places? How we give more hosting models and more options for you to code with functions? Um, in special, a lot of the enterprise scenarios I spend my time on. And for me, it's also interesting. I joined um, sort of the Azure world with Microsoft for a long time, but Azure um, about six years ago. And I joined an app service when we would come to conferences like build other conferences, and a lot of people didn't believe PaaS would become a reality, the reality it is today. So I feel like we are in functions as a service and serverless on that same journey. It's still somewhat young, and there's still some adoption happening, but, um, but I'm super excited to see where that's going to take and how that's revolutionizing the industry. So that's me. Um, Daria. Hi, I'm Daria Grigoriou. I'm also part of the PM team for Azure Functions. I've been in this space of platform as a service and later functions as a service since 2012. Um, and one fun fact, I was the program manager for the first iteration of our serverless offer, so uh, the launch of the consumption plan. And um, I'm here because I'm really interested in how we bring joy to your experience as you adopt serverless technologies and as you start working with Azure Functions. So I'm always happy to take ideas from all of you. I can give you this so you can click there. To navigate this session, we will use a demo app to illustrate concepts. And for the purpose of this session, we are the agency that is building the web presence for the Contoso Coffee Shop. You're in Seattle, so from the keynote to the sessions, um, you have to hear about coffee. And um, we just really wanted to have an opportunity to extend the portfolio of this hardworking Contoso Corporation with um, a coffee shop. So when we started our project, we inherited a client app, this is a static client app, and a legacy web API that uh, is listing locations of all things. And the other entry points that are critical for the web presence of this business are just stubs that we need to figure out how to implement. And we liked the idea um, of a static app front end because we can leverage um, serverless compute and microservices patterns in the back end. And also, you probably noticed we're not the best front end engineers, so this works for our agency. And as we walk through the session, we'll look at all the different pieces that we need to compose to deliver the end-to-end -end architecture for this business. Yeah, so 
how many of you are using functions today already, just so I have an idea? OK. How many of you use um, just serverless in general, just so I see if I get more people, some that didn't raise their hand? So I'll level set just a little bit so you know everyone can follow along what we have here. So one slide on serverless. Um, so as you know, it's called serverless. There's controversy whether that term is the right term, but what it really means is once you are in a hosted service, you don't worry about a lot about the infrastructure that's under you. You're going to give us your application, and then we'll take care of all of it. You don't have to specify the size of the machine you need, what's, how, many, how many cores you need of CPU, how much memory you need, or what are your scale needs. You just put your application there. As events happen, those applications react to events, scales as far and as wide as it needs to process your workload, spins back down, goes all the way down to zero when you're not using. We do measure how many milliseconds the CPU was running your code, so you only pay for when your code's running at a given amount of memory that, that, you, that you consume. So that's serverless in less than a minute. So when you say serverless, that's what we're, we mean. Um, Azure Functions, again, one slide just on, on Azure Functions with the diagram, and then I'm going to jump into code. Um, Azure Functions is the, pro, the pro core programming piece and where you have your compute for serverless in Azure. It responds to a number of events, HTTP, of course, and it's a push-based event, and there are a lot of events that we can pull from, such as queues and service bus and event hub, et cetera, so some can work on a timer as well. Once those events happen, we run your code and your custom logic within our functions runtime, and you can bring your code in C-sharp, F-sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, PowerShell that uh, I'm going to talk more about and we launched last week. And once it's done, it can output. We have this nice concept of bindings that a lot of the outputs actually can be made very simple because the runtime can transform some of your outputs in richer types or communicate to external APIs. So that's functions in a nutshell because I know a lot of you are very familiar with it and how that, some of these concepts translate to code. Um, so that's a simple, as simple as possible functions code that, uh, trigger, um, that's queue triggered. When you, when you see the function name attribute at the top there, that's what determines that this code is a function. The first attribute you have in your run method is going to be your trigger type. Um, in this case, it's a queue trigger. And the, the string you see there is the name of your queue and maps to or a variable in your code that you can use, and then you have your output binding, so you see the out parameter there. And once this code runs, it will write back to a queue. So that's as simple as possible that functions and those things you're declaring as attributes, you could also declare them as a configuration in your functions.json. So you could have your input and output and some of the other configurations that happens at the function level, they're all going to go into functions.json. Those are the main components. So when you say, when we say like your functions, all you have to give to us is code and config, that's what we mean. Could be C sharp, JavaScript, and then the functions.json. So that's the intro on functions. Um, and then we're gonna start building up the scenarios and, and you're gonna see some of these concepts come back around. So the first app extension example is focused on creating um, an unified API surface that encompasses existing assets that are already in production and new business logic that is implemented with the help of serverless. In this world, when we create an API facade, we can create uh, that with the help of API management, which coincidentally was the session right before this one. And it makes it really easy to connect to serverless concepts. What I like about this in using API management is it's not just a design pattern, but it comes with the benefit of having real features behind a product, like the ability to define policies, to handle auth, to handle versioning. So the more the product can do, the less I have to do as a developer. And I would like you to notice in the diagrams here, the business logic can be implemented by a mix of services, whether they're legacy, whether they're completely new. And so here we're using a legacy web API 
And then we're adding functions, and if you'd like, you can add connections to services such as Kubernetes. So there's no limiting factor here. And since we're talking about serverless, we also have to focus on the specific tier of API management that was uh, recently announced in preview, which is the serverless tier. And so um, with this tier, um, I would like to mention that you get all the benefits of serverless in the sense of you get the auto scale and high availability and the paper use pricing with the generous free grant. And the primary use cases encompass the different products in this universe in the sense of it acts as a gateway for serverless computing, container-based microservices. It provides a simplified um, facade for um, other entities that exist in our universe, such as event sources. And then um, it's working really well for uh, workloads that have spiky traffic. So when we go back to our demo app, uh, the element that we're going to explore in this section is really adding API management and the connection through the additional business logic. So I will walk you through this little demo here. So this is uh, what we ended up for um, our coffee shop. And what we started with is just the ability to get locations out of our legacy web API. And then we added a connection to Cosmos DB through Azure Functions to list out the menu. And then uh, we added about functionality that is actually going to show you in the future sections how you can communicate with your team. And um, we, we have a few different other pieces that we're going to walk through. But just starting back with the web API. So the web API is getting locations, and you can see it right here in the API management portal. So we have a call, and we were able to go and retrieve our locations. So you can see the same result here. And then you might ask, how easy is it to import my functions into this? I don't want to do any work, or at least not anything complicated. So I would like to walk you through that workflow. So here we just have an example function. Um, it's just doing an HTTP trigger. And if I want to import into APIM, all I have to do is go and select a APIM management um, option here. So you can see it in the portal. And this is um, embedded in the experience, so you don't have to break your flow. I'm going to select the uh, APIM instance that I want to import to. And I'm going to enable application insights because this will give you really interesting observability um, capabilities. And now, in terms of API, API entry points, we're going to create one for each of the HTTP methods that's supported by the function. And optionally, I may even go and select a product. So now I kicked off my workflow to import my functions into APIM. And I will get a message when this is completed, which you can see right here. Let's see if I can zoom in. So now I can even go and test it out right here in this portal. Um, and I have um, a test tab that I can select. And all I have to do is add a parameter. So um, let's say build 2019. And I'm going to make a call. And you can see the result right here. Um, and it just says, hello, build 2019. There we go. And what else can you do that might be really interesting to have right here in this concept? Another thing that you can do is you can download the API definition. This is just a click away. It's really as easy as that. And then another feature that can be really, really useful is the observability piece of this. So as I connect APIM, I also want to see what happens across all the different endpoints that I'm interacting with. 
So there's this really interesting feature, the application map, that is going to allow me to explore the calls that I'm making. And not only that, uh, but it's going to allow me to um, have really easy uh, diagnostic capabilities. So in this case, I'm, I'm purposely generating an exception that we'll use throughout the session. And if I want to go and diagnose that, I have the ability right here to say, hey, I want to see details. And not only do I want to see details, but why don't you point me to the exact exception? And hey, we can actually go do exactly that. This is the demo exception. So um, this is the power of creating your unified API service with very little effort. Yeah, and just like that, um, the demo that uh, Dari did to investigate the failure, um, some people take it for granted as you do more microservices and distributed apps. For you to find where the bug is in your code between your API layer, multiple services that you're using, all disconnected, running async, it's a real tough task. So just bringing them all together and be able to either give you a graphical interface or, or a query language that you can go through the logs to find your errors is super powerful and something that I haven't seen uh, other products do. So. Love that stuff. Oh, and it's me. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so so now let's. So we extended we extended with with APIM, created a single fa facade, single surface for all that functionality that didn't exist on our coffee shop, for which Dari and I have been hired for the day to be developers for. Okay, so this. This application, and it's common, as you have a presence on the cloud, typically you have tons of other resources as well. Your application, if it's complex, it's not all serverless. It can be all sorts of other components that are deployed to Azure. So what we see more and more is as you, as you add resources to Azure, you need to have a way, especially once you start having hundreds of them, each resource is a life cycle of its own. You're going to deploy your resources. And again, they could be VMs. They could be storage, SQL, you name it. But you deploy them, then you go to that life cycle. You have to secure that endpoints according to your rules. You're going to have to do your disaster recovery or a backup to a different region. You need to monitor to react when things go wrong. Then you might need to apply different configurations or policy that's required by your, your organization. So that's very common. Like it's, uh, it's been changing a little bit. If some of you work as, as ITs or, or you're an SRE, the role has been changing a little bit because now you have to monitor all these cloud resources. And you have to take care of it, and there are, there are hundreds of them. So you need to get to a real cloud automation. The good thing there is a lot of these things are event-driven by nature. Either they happen on a schedule, you have to do something every day at 6 p.m., or because an event happened, like an application reached the limit of failure that someone has to react. So, so for those fun functions and event-driven architectures fits perfectly because you can have that event trigger a code to run. However, one gap we had functions as a platform is a lot of this automation, it's written in PowerShell. So just last week, we started the preview of PowerShell core and functions, allows for you to implement such scenarios with Azure Functions now. So going back to our demo, um, what we, we coded here, one part of the functionality, the about uh, functionality I'm going to show, we. Um, it's failing, and we have to investigate. And imagine you want to automate when such failures happen to trigger a script that will notify you somehow. So I'm switch to my machine so you can start seeing this thing in action. OK. So I'm here, same, same UI. And again, our dev team doesn't have a designer, so that's why it looks like this. Looks interesting. Um, and then when I click. The about is generating a 500. So imagine that any of that website could generate an event, some, some error that I want to monitor. How would you do that? So I'm on the Azure portal now, and I have my resources deployed in resource groups. And this nice functionality that resource groups have is the ability for you to configure alerts. right? And those alerts, once you configure, you get this dashboard, and you can tell what severity the alert is, how it can react, all the counts of alerts, and how um, um, how they happen, when they happen, you can drill in. Um, the way you configure an alert, um, you can create an event and a condition for it. And this one that I uh, created was if any error in the 500 range happens and it's greater than zero, even if a single one happened, 
do react to it. And then you can create an action group of which actions you want to take when these things happen. So here, um, you manage the action groups. Uh, what I configured was a webhook. You can configure it to send an email to you. And that webhook, it's calling to an endpoint. And this endpoint here, it's just an Azure function, uh, send teams notification alert, right, with the authentication code. So, so now I can have an HTTP function that listens to that endpoint that can react to it. So let's show you that, how that function looks like. So this is the, the PowerShell function uh, on the Azure portal. And, and that, that function is pretty simple. Most of it is, takes, takes the input parameter, configure how to call, and I'll show that in a, in a minute, how to call into Teams because that's how I want my notification to be delivered via Teams, because Teams can you know, alert my phone, it can alert a group of people. And then I configure the actual alert and the text that's gonna be fired. That's essentially what that function does. At the end of it, once you prepare all the data, you invoke that endpoint. Just to show how that's configured, uh, the Teams webhook um, is configured here, so it's gonna call uh, a graph API that's gonna go to Teams. So, if I go to Teams, because I clicked on that about before and generated an, an event, you see that alert, alert has been fired. So that's how the alert would look like. And again, this could pop on your, on your phone or any, anywhere you want. So that's a very simple example of PowerShell running in practice. There's, um, there's a lot more you can do. One thing while I'm here that I want to show is um, we're going to, we have this serverless library that shows a lot of the common functions code. So if you don't want to start from scratch, I know in the Azure portal we give you some templates that start your code. But if you want some solutions that are ready to be deployed, you can go here and you find that solution in a bunch of languages. Because we have just launched PowerShell, we have uh, one script so far, but for JavaScript you have dozens of them. And then you could find some for PowerShell as well here. So, so if you want to get started, ready-made example with serverless library. Now let's talk. Let me talk about some other um, other scenarios in which um, automation in PowerShell can be useful. Go ahead. All right. So that's what I implemented. Just something that reacts uh, reacts to the about. But here's some other examples and some other ways you can hook up those event-based automation. So you can have tons of things that happen during deployment time. They're listed there, or you want to operate. You can do a pub sub model and use event grid, and then you can have um, multiple publishers or multiple subscribers to that that can react to it. So it allows you to connect anything to anything else, so you can have the compute on functions um, for any resource you want to trigger from. You could have Azure monitors, the one I showed, so alerts could trigger your application. Logic apps can call into functions as well or you can have your DevOps pipeline actually call into functions. So tons of different ways uh, you can implement your automation. Um, so one that I just want to show here is the probably the most common one people ask is to start and stop their VMs because it cuts down costs or because they don't want those VMs running uh, all the time. So here is, is an example of how to start a VM, and this is a simple as it gets, and it gets even simpler because we implemented this functionality called manage dependencies. So a lot of the Azure SDK things that we would need to bring with your code, we already preloaded for you on our deployed uh, functions runtime that runs PowerShell. So, and the authentication as well. So you see that this is not authenticating with Azure or is bringing any other dependencies. All you have to do is this piece of code and this would run and start your VM. Similarly, you could do a stop VM um, as well. So I have those two examples. Again, they're on the serverless library. If you want to look into them um, when you get back home or on the airplane. And yeah, now we're going to continue the third, third extensibility scenario. So for the third extensibility scenario, we're going to talk about workflow orchestration with durable functions. And I would like you to keep in mind, this is an advanced feature for writing long-running orchestration. It can help you solve a range of complex and stateful coding problems in the serverless space. Durable Functions is implemented um, as an Azure Functions ex extension and is built on the open source durable task framework. And what that means is um, 
durable functions, just like the rest of functions, um, is open source. And it also has a serverless model of hosting where you pay only for what you use. The durable functions is actually not that different from other functions, except for three very specific concepts. The concepts are, one of them, orchestrator. And the orchestrator describes how actions are executed and the order in which they are executed. The second one is the activity functions. And the activity functions just represent the unit of work. And this is where the actions that we request are implemented. The client functions, they create new instances of an orchestration. So these are just the three concepts that are specific here. The orchestrator is the one that stores execution state and then replace that state to basically reestablish that durability um, every single run. And um, just looking at the concepts here, so we have um, an example of the client function here. And the first thing that we have is an orchestrator client binding, and that is the one that can start and stop the orchestrator instances, and then it can get um, instance status and send event notifications. And um, here you can see the transition to the orchestrator function. So if we look at what that looks like, this is our orchestrator right here, and then the orchestrator is the one that calls the activity functions. So just to give you an idea, of how this actually happens in practice. Uh, we can look at the, the workflow that we use for a, um, an example orchestration. And the first thing that we do is we have the client who is waking up the orchestrator by placing an item on, on the control queue. So that has the effect of waking up the orchestrator who noticed there's work to do, and it goes and it replays the state to establish where we are, and we notice that we haven't actually completed that work. So at this point, the orchestrator can place an item on the work item queue, and it's asked to await, so it can now go to sleep. And the activity function can pick up the item from the work item queue, and it can execute while we asked it to execute. It places an item on the control queue to let the orchestrator do something to look at, and then the orchestrator will go, it will replay the state, notice that yes, now we have a result, and return. So going back to our Contoso coffee shop, we also extended our app with the ability to do order approvals. So let's say I'm the barista and I need to order more coffee because, hey, there's build and there's so many people in town, and so I need to request approval for um, my coffee. And so we implemented that with the durable workflow pattern. And um, just going to illustrate that, Let's go back to our little application here. Um, and the way that I'm going to um, place the uh, approval request is by saying I want to um, order a certain coffee blend. And then uh, I'm going to submit a request, um, which shows up as a text message. And I'm sure you all can see it. <laughs> um, we're all close enough. And that text message is going to be the one that allows me to approve the order. So I'll do it right here. And I can I, prove to all of you she really approved it. It was not. Yes, not and, and we really banked on the fact that you can see the phone screen <laughs> from there. But you know what you can see is that we have a change of status here. So if we zoom in, you can see that we did change the status, and this now shows approved. So how did we do it? I want to um, give you an opportunity to have a look at the client code first. So we had a client app page that showed you how we are requesting the approval. And 
um, all that is, it's basically calling into um, this URL for the orchestrator here. It's actually um, abstracted. It's a call to the um, Drawbell task framework underneath. But um, this is what it looks like from the client perspective. Now, just to go to the other side of the client experience, and then we'll move back to the back end of durable functions. The other side of the client experience that you just witnessed here is how do I send the approval? And um, this, again, is a call from the client app. And the way that um, I implement that is by raising um, an event. So this is um, the code right here to raise the SMS challenge response event. Switching back to the back end, here we have the orchestrator code. So I will point out that as we are in this context, we have the ability to um, call the activity function right here. And this is the one where we send the phone number and we request for um, the SMS to be sent. And for this particular demo, we um, set a timeout of 90 seconds. But the, the good thing to know is that this is not constrained. Um, 90 seconds is just an example timeout. The power of the durable um, functions is that you can really have as long running operations as you need. And then um, the other thing I would like to point out is that here, the orchestrator will actually go to sleep while it's waiting for an async operation to be completed. So that addresses some of the questions in terms of, hey, do I get charged for everything? Um, and you only get charged when this is running. And just um, a little note on how st uh, state is stored. So we store that in um, a table storage. And so um, I'm just one, uh, showing you an example that we won't go through, but it proves that the different stages of execution um, are uh, going through. Okay, so back to the slides. And also just to highlight, one, uh, the reason the approval workflow is interesting is because the, the time that it would take for a human to react, that's not predictable, but we do know your function if it runs for over 10 minutes, a regular functions will shut it down, right? So, so this type of pattern um, which is, is just not possible, it's just regular functions. You'd be limited to those 10 minutes unless you deploy functions as dedicated, but if you found that serverless way to do so, you need something like durable. So, so that's, that's why durable is important in this scenario. And um, so for this particular session, we only showed you the human interaction pattern with durable functions. Um, however, there are a lot of other patterns that you can implement, and these are a few of the other examples. Um, you can do uh, functions chaining, where you take the output of a function and you use it the, as the input to call another function. You can um, also do um, the fan in and fan out pattern, where you can use an event to um, parallelize execution into a bunch of functions, and the power of this particular pattern is that you can do aggregation at the end. And then um, the, the API um, pattern with um, async HTTP APIs, this is something where you may have a long-running execution and you may want to let um, a client uh, tier know what's going on. And this is actually how our little example was implemented as well. We have a way to go and query uh, status through the HTTP 202 pattern. And then uh, monitoring on an external endpoint would be another one. And um, we have a session coming up right after that is really focused on a deep dive on durable functions. Um, and it's uh, going to go into the new features for stateful entities as well. So I would totally recommend that if you have the time. Uh, there are a few gotchas with um, this workflow. So the orchestrator has a couple of requirements. The first one is that the orchestrator code must be deterministic. Because every operation has to have the same result. Um, it will be executed once, and then we will replay the same result. 
So um, what you don't want to do is don't use random numbers, don't generate GUIDs, don't do I.O. directly in the orchestrator. The other one is don't write infinite loops because what happens is we have an increasingly long history that we need to replay through, and that means that your execution time might increase as well. So going back to the last section yeah. of our presentation. And I, and I love the durable functions things. I think it's still, we love talking about it because it opens up so many possibilities. Just a little detail that I showed, like, like when you do a task and you can wait and you can do a when all, it's just so, so powerful. Like, um, so if you haven't tried, try it out. Now, last uh, way we want to extend scenarios with, uh, with machine learning. Uh, how many work with ML some way or another? So I have a show of hands. So a few of you. So it's good because I have a, just a few context here, just a few slides to, to see what, why ML and why, why you should care and how you can implement it. So, so typical um, process of machine learning um, is divided into model training and model deployment. Um, so in very basics, typically what you, you have is a large data set in a raw format that you want to turn that into a model. You want to learn from those examples. But this data set will have dirty data. It's going to be incomplete. It's not going to be in a standard format. So you need to pre-process that data. This is an iterative process until you get the data in the state you need, remove duplicates, and so on and so forth. Once you have that the right way, you're going to pick there are tons of different algorithms in ML, like logistic regression, naive Bayes, you name it. And you can pick the right algorithm for the job you're trying to achieve. If it's, if it's something related to images, you might want to pick neural network. If it's related to text, you might pick something different. So you pick the right algorithm. Once you pick that, you typically reserve some of the data set to be your golden set to evaluate that model. You're going to get a precision recall number back to decide which model fits your needs in terms of what's your criteria for it to go to production. Once you find that model, you actually deploy it and use it in your application. A lot of you, if you're developers, you're probably on the farther end of it is where you typically live, which is on the application world. Um, so, so now, the way, the way this is typically done is you have a data scientist, and he's the one responsible for model training. A lot of his day job is on the data set and cleaning up, finding the right data. And then, just like I showed, the algorithm that they want to use, and then how often do they need to retrain to account for new examples that are happening on a particular scenario. The app developer typically is left with the job of, hey, the model does exist. How do I put this in production? Like, what is, what is the right model? Do I need to use a VM? Do I need to use a pass service? Um, how, how do I load this up in memory? Do I break it down? Do I separate, uh, do, I, do I process in parallel? Do I process linearly? How do I scale in case this model is something that's going to have thousands of events at the same time, how are you prepared to handle such load? And when things fail, how do I monitor it? So if you can think, if you're noticing the pattern, all these questions, what solves all these questions is serverless really helps with all of these questions. So once you apply serverless or function as a service, now you can take advantage of all those things I talked before about serverless and then have this thing ready to scale. But let me show how that works actually in functions. So when you train a model, typically you get an asset out of it. Typically the model is in a binary format. And you have a script. That script knows how to use that model. Very commonly, it's going to be Python, what's going to be that scoring script. And on your Python code, you might have some dependencies. There's going to bring some libraries, helper libraries, or some other libraries that you might want to use. Once you have all that, you can deploy to Azure Functions. Also, something we, we didn't have before, we start uh, with uh, Python's on public preview. Um, and let's say your function is an HTTP trigger function. You can have your input data using the HTTP trigger to, to use that model. So, so that's typically how it works, but I, I want to actually show you. So, so we didn't, I didn't add it to the main app. This was done by our research and innovation team, so it's a little different because it's ML. We're trying to find a fun scenario. It's a little silly, so bear with me. I know all of you have this question on how to order enough coffee for your development teams, so we thought this was super relevant to this audience. So and there is, um, 
again, the point of the presentation is not as much model training. Um, I don't intend to turn you all into data scientists in a, in a talk, but so there's a bunch of data sets already ready for you. Kaggle has one of those. So we found this fascinating data set that do analyze, it's amazing how much time people spent on this, um, how, much, how much programmers drink coffee, and they analyze the patterns. They were able to map coding hours to the amount of cup, uh, cups of coffee per day, what time of the day they drink it, what type of coffee, et cetera. So you can, this, this gives you so many possibilities. But, okay, so what we did with, with all of this, we created um, one, one app here, and this is the front end, that goes in a given GitHub repository, looks like at the amount of commits, assume a given number of hours per commit, and then we'll estimate how, much, how many more cups of coffee you need to keep your team running for the next few days. Again, super useful. I'll share the code because I know you need it. But, um, so, but, but let's show the code now out of the fun part. Like, that's the part that, that does matter. How do, how do you leverage those things on Azure Functions, right? So here's, here's Python running in VS Code and Azure Functions. Again, normal VS Code, you'd get your local, de local debugging, you'd get the Azure Functions extension, all that goodness. And it is a function, like any other function, this is a HTTP function um, that loads a model. Like I said, the model, model is a binary format. It's here, but you can see the content of it, of course. But you load it up in your code. Um, and the code's actually pretty simple. What, what's gonna do is gonna get, based on the amount of commits, it's gonna get a number of hours that that particular repository had coded, and then send that to the model to predict. So that's the part that's gonna predict the amount of coffee cups you need for the next 48 hours. And then sends the response back to our web front end. And this is very native to Python as well. So things like the way you bring dependencies is requirements.txt. If you're not familiar with Python, that's how you do it. Similar how you'd have NuGet for .NET or NPM for, for JavaScript. And you'd bring all sorts of dependencies you need, let's say the SciPy one that helps you with the math libraries and statistical libraries, for instance. So, so that's your code. You can, from here, you can deploy to, to your Azure function. I'm gonna show this code running. So if I go here, and this is all the functions of the repository. I didn't wanna pick any of your repository. I didn't want you guys to make any assumptions about your teams, but, and we have the functions repository, um, which is essentially a meta repository that only has announcements, doesn't have many check-ins, so one cup's enough, probably, that's for the PM team. Okay, and then the host, which is our function's runtime is, assume 18 cups, people are working hard, and then our tools, 59 cups, okay. We're doing a lot of work in our tooling, it seems like, but this calls the backend that Azure functions that's running the cloud to do that prediction, so calls exactly this model predict line of code. Um, so super easy to, for you to just host and take advantage of serverless with Python in, in, in machine learning scenarios. Um, I'm gonna go back here. But there is, machine learning actually gets a little bit more, more, more complicated. So this is a very simple scenario, but not always simple. So some of them, what we've noticed is some of these models, they are a beast in terms of memory. Like, a normal function running consumptions, you have only up to 1.5 gigabytes of memory. So a lot of times you need more than that. So if you take advantage of things like, um, like the premium plan, now it can go up to 14 gigabytes of memory, for instance. Some of those executions actually take longer than the 10 minutes execution. That's where we direct explain the durable functions will come in and will be super handy. Um, some of the, even the inference, but definitely model training, will require hardware that you don't normally have on the Azure Function Service, because you have premium consumption. But if you want GPU, FPGA, some accelerated hardware, then what you can do, and if some of you have seen, we announced functions can run Kubernetes, we announced a scaler for Kubernetes as well. So you could provision this type of hardware to run on your Kubernetes cluster and de deploy your functions to it so it can take advantage of the underlying hardware. Again, a runtime is the same that runs across wherever you deploy it. So the functions experience is gonna be exactly like the one I just showed. Um, another part is interesting and there's a lot of talk about is I showed how to bring a Python code with config and, and you can deploy all of that. But 
a lot of environments now you're developing containers. The way you're packaging your application is in a container format, and you want to host a container. So we do, we do offer that. Some people might not know, but um, we have an Azure Functions for Linux. So you can bring your container. Your container will include the Azure Functions runtime. We'll include your code, your dependencies. You deploy to us, and we'll take care of it, of running your functions into it. The things on the roadmap is how to scale that serverless based on events uh, um, in the future. Um, the other part is sometimes some of this data set, and it's very common in some industries, is that the data set cannot leave on premises. The, the policy, for whatever reason, the company want to keep those, that data on prem, on your own network. So for that, you need to tunnel in your functions running on the cloud to be able to access that, that network. So for that, the premium plan gives you a bunch of other options that you can create, um, access resources on a VNet, and you could do that communication both ways. But a lot, some other times, you also want your code that process that data to be fully isolated, no HTTP endpoint exposed. So for that, you can have full isolation by using the app service environment and run your functions in app service environment. So ton of different options. Again, none of these limitations are particular to Python or ML. It's just functions in general. We always like to say, try serverless. That should be a great way. It solves 90% of the cases. But at some of the other cases, you will need one of these options at the bottom that to give you power to overcome some of these, these limits that you might face. So a few takeaways for this session. The first one, we have a lot of announcements around Azure Functions, um, either at build or in proximity to build. And we know that you get so much information. So um, just go look at the Azure blog, and you'll find a lot of our um, announcements with uh, resources for further learning and links to our docs and everything that you need to get started. That um, includes a broad range of announcements from um, running functions on Kubernetes with serverless scale to um, new uh, development language improvements and announcements. So uh, the announcement of PowerShell Core and then improvements for um, our .NET, .NET support with dependency injection, improvements for our .NET non-.NET language experience with extension bundles, and then um, going into developer experience with improved Azure DevOps uh, support, and um, a bunch of others that you can definitely go and um, look at um, as part of our build announcements. The other thing that I um, want to make sure we mention here is that um, getting started is really easy. If you don't want to write your own code, you can get started with samples that are available in the serverless community library. And also, you can contribute to that. And you can um, make sure that the world gets to benefit from your code um, if you submit it as a sample. Just to recap what we learned today, we have a few design patterns that we covered. And those ones cover um, creating unified API services, uh, surfaces, event-driven automation, the long-running orchestration, and machine learning with Azure Functions. But these are just examples. We know that you have business logic that's already in production, and you don't need to rewrite it. You can always extend it and leverage existing assets and really enhance their value with serverless technologies. Also, we know that serverless, like Eduardo said, is the appropriate for maybe the majority of cases, but there will be cases where you need to use something else. So don't be afraid to break the serverless glass and create composed solutions. They really work. If you want to get started, there are a lot of resources to get started with Azure Functions on azure.com functions. And also, um, you can go to our GitHub repos. You got introduced to them in terms of coffee cups, but they're real, and um, they really allow you to participate in our community, whether it's just to signal an issue and tell us we need to fix something, whether they're, um, they're participating in the discussion, or whether you want to submit PRs to improve our product. Any and all of those are always welcome. 
Yeah, and we're pretty, we're pretty active on, I think we're pretty active, like on Twitter too, if you want to reach out to us. Also, realize we'll have time in the end. I know some of these announcements, we didn't, we didn't cover some of them at all, so if you have questions on any of them, DI, integration with DevOps, um, any of the stuff you've seen there, um, we're happy to answer either here or online later or at the booth uh, as well. And there are a few more things coming out. And to the few more things coming, <laughs> uh, we have a couple more sessions that are coming up this afternoon, so we wanted to make sure you're aware. And then um, there'll be uh, recordings for the other sessions that are covering serverless concepts. We wanted to say thank you so much. We know you have a large choice and a lot of options, and you chose to learn about serverless in this session, so thank you. And um, we always appreciate feedback, and we um, appreciate that there are a lot of resources that you can use to continue your learning. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>